In honor of Mental Health Awareness Month, we are focusing today on self-injury. It is estimated that nearly one in five people have self-injured themselves uh, have in their lifetime. The nonprofit Self-Injury Recovery and Awareness, also known as CIRA, is helping people recover from self-injury through a peer support group model. Joining me live to talk about this is Amanda Beausoleil, founder of the organization. Good morning, Amanda. For people who might remember our former reporter, Sophia, you're re you guys are related, right? Yes, good morning. Sophia is my older sister, so I was so excited to tell her that I would be on her old stomping grounds. Tell her that you made a trip to KPRC today to be on our screen. We appreciate okay. having you. What is the overall mission of Sierra? Thank you for having me. And Sears overall mission is to help people recover from self-injury and also normalize the conversation and lower the stigma. We hope to reach 500,000 people within the next two years, including people that engage in the behavior, their families, healthcare providers, and educational institutions. I, I think this is really good to be talking about. You know, like the more you talk about it, the less stigma there is, right? And what are some of the behaviors and warning signs that people could be on the lookout for? Some things you can look out for is if someone's wearing long sleeves and long pants during the summer, if they're having wounds or cuts that aren't healing or in the same place, those are some key indicators that someone may be engaging in the behavior. That would still be um, something maybe not enough that somebody would feel that they could spark a conversation over. What, what are some of your tips for if you have a family member or a friend that's maybe doing some of this maybe unusual behavior? How do you start that conversation? It starts off making sure you're in a private space so they feel as comfortable as possible mm -hmm. and ask them, do you know what self-injury is? Do you or anyone you know engage in the behavior? And also ask them if they're willing to talk and letting them know you're there to listen without judgment. That's really, that's a really good tip. What about if you're the person suffering from this? Um, how do you, you know, what if you do want to talk to somebody? What if you do want to tell somebody about this? But there's so much fear of judgment. How would you suggest that they go about starting the conversation? I would think about who do you want to go to? Who do you trust? Again, making sure you're in a safe environment, that the person is available and in a good headspace to talk to you about this scary topic and letting them know that it's something you engage in and that you're willing to find help and you want support and that you may not know why you're engaging in the behavior, but you're wanting somebody to know because you want to feel less alone. Since this is an isolating behavior, the antidote is connection. With your organization, we started off by saying it was a peer model support. Uh, what, what does that mean? What can people expect if they reach out to your organization? We have three peer-to-peer -peer support group meetings on Zoom, so anyone around the world can attend. And we also have our own literature that are journal prompts to really help people understand and get to the root of why they're engaging in the behavior and we also are expanding our meetings to meet demand so we'll have even more meetings during the week where people with lived experience can talk to each other and understand each other's struggles and hear other people's stories so they may recover from self-injury as well. Wonderful. So we will definitely be linking to your organization on our website, clicktohouston.com. I think that you're doing wonderful things, and I, I hope people now feel comfortable reaching out to you, uh, especially with all of the great advice that you've given during this segment. We appreciate you know, your time. Thank you for having me. 